It's a cold December day in the winter of 1944. The Nazis are not exactly in a good position to win the war. Hitler rages day after day, fearing an embarrassing, cataclysmic loss, but his propagandists are still hard at work, trying to persuade people to embrace the Nazi cause. On Germany's state radio, SS officers are speaking to a man named Captain Martin Vietamt, an American who has supposedly seen the light. He says into the microphone, what most Americans don't understand is that Adolf Hitler is right. There is a Jewish communist conspiracy to enslave the world. We must support the Nazis' aims before it's too late. People are listening to this back in the US. Some are wondering if he's right, but the vast majority are shouting, traitor. This man needs to be met with the firing squad. We'll come back to Captain Martin and his date with the firing squad soon. He was, after all, the traitor. But first, we need to understand what might have led a man to do what no other US soldier had. That is, defect to the Nazis. Vithaupt was not his real surname. His actual full name was Martin James Monti, born on October 24, 1921 to a father of Italian heritage and a mother of German heritage. The name Vithaupt came from his mother's side. The family lived in St. Louis, Missouri. They were well off. The kids never struggled like the other children in those days. They grew up with everything they needed. Later in life, four of Martin's brothers would go on to serve in the United States Navy during World War II. And unlike Martin, they do an honorable job. The path to Martin becoming the family's ugly duckling started in the 1930s, when much of the US was down on its knees, beset by the poverty of the Great Depression. This seemed to greatly affect young Martin. It was a time when people were looking for someone to blame. It was a time when some Americans turned to fascism, when they looked for scapegoats, someone to blame for their empty kitchen shelves and bare fridges. If indeed they were fortunate enough to even have a fridge. While the Monty family got on okay during this difficult period in US history, St. Louis had plenty of hellholes filled with a plethora of so-called down and outs. 3,000 to 5,000 of them made up one of the infamous Hoovervilles in St. Louis. These were shanty towns that had popped up like unwanted warts in various places in the US. We're telling you this to help you understand why an American man from St. Louis might begin to distrust capitalism and why he might have considered the greedy, uncaring capitalists were to blame for the woes of the world. And so, when a priest named Father Charles Coughlin took to the airwaves and condemned what he said was the personification of evil, bankers, Martin Monty listened intently. But while Coughlin had every right to criticize the banking industry, he ranted and raved about Jewish bankers. His message to many of his radio show fans were steeped in anti-Semitism. He talked about social justice and the horror of free market capitalism. But as time went on, he showed support for the fascists in Germany and Italy. He also hated communism, which he said was an evil in the world that robs people of happiness. He once explained, I have dedicated my life to fighting against the heinous rottenness of modern capitalism because it robs the laborer of this world's goods, but blow for blow I shall strike against communism. His critique of greed and his disdain for the banking industry was not especially unique during an era when many Americans were literally starving to death. But when the priest went right over to the far right with his views and started praising the governments of Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, some of his fans said he'd gone too far. Still, many people said he was right. He stoked division so much that he was accused of trying to incite civil war in the US. One of the people who never relinquished his support for Coughlin was the young and impressionable Martin Monty. So now you know the backstory, here's the front part. When the war broke out in 1939, Coughlin's millions of listeners were absolutely enraged when the government took his radio show off the air. He got cancelled, 30s style. Monty was furious, talking about demonic conspiracies of invisible hands. In August of 1942, like his brothers, Martin signed up for the draft. He told his family he wanted to fight for the Allies in this disgusting war. But was he telling the truth? We asked that because around two months later he traveled to Detroit and met with a man he adored, the fascist fanatic Father Coughlin. We don't know exactly what was said during that meeting, but we think as this show goes on you'll be able to make a good guess. We know Monty first tried to join the US Navy, but it was the Air Force that accepted him in November 1942. Monty trained as a cadet in 43, and then in March 44 he was told he'd be a flight officer. He subsequently passed his training to fly a P-39 Air Cobra and later a P-38 Lightning, which gained him a promotion to second lieutenant. Notably, his training would help him make his plan come to fruition. In August 1944, Monty was sitting on a ship on the way to India. When he arrived, he joined the 126th Replacement Depot. It was now only a matter of time until he was actually deployed to the battlefront. As his fellow soldiers talked about taking down Hitler and the rest of the wretched Nazis, Monty had other things in mind. Quite contrary things, in fact. He didn't wait for deployment, instead deciding just to blag his way out of the British colony of India. 
Questions should have been asked when he just walked into an air transport plane heading to Cairo. Although his rank and uniform no doubt helped, he later walked onto another plane which took him to Tripoli, and after that he did the same thing again to get to Naples and Italy. On October 10th, he ended up at an air base not too far from Naples. There he met with some guys from the 82nd Fighter Group, some of whom he'd known from flight school. He attempted to join them, but since he'd pretty much flown around the world without any orders to do so, he was without papers. He didn't get any joy there. Nonetheless, that didn't stop him. He then went to a place called Pomigliano de Arco, just north of Naples. There, the 354th Air Service Squadron was getting aircraft ready for fighter squadrons. Monty had to stretch the truth again. On October 13th, he lied and said he was a pilot from the 82nd Fighter Group. No one suspected he was up to no good, so he was handed the keys when he volunteered to test an unarmed reconnaissance P-38, the type of plane he practiced in. He didn't take the plane for a test flight, but flew it right over to Nazi-occupied Milan. The Nazis saw the plane coming in and thought, what in the Fuhrer's name is going on? That's an American plane! No sooner than Monty put two feet on Italian ground, he was being escorted away by German forces. They didn't believe him at first when he said he was on the side of Hitler and explained he was a fascist. They took him as a POW, and then they found it strange that he landed a perfectly good aircraft in their territory. They even studied it to better understand what kind of plane the Americans were developing. In November, after telling them about Father Coughlin and explaining why he hated the corrupt Western capitalist and morally bankrupt communists, they finally believed Monty was an actual deserter. Now he was useful. Deserters always make the other side look bad. That's why they usually got shot or hanged if they ever went back. The Nazis soon put Monty to work, first appearing on the radio in Berlin as Captain Martin Vithaupt. He talked in English about how righteous the Nazis were. He said that the US had gotten it all wrong fighting alongside the Soviets. Monty said the Soviets wanted to enslave mankind under communism, which, to be fair, if you know much about Stalin, wasn't too far from the truth. During this stint talking on the radio, he bumped into another American traitor. That was a woman named Mildred Gillers. In the future, she would achieve the accolade of being the first female American to be convicted of treason. So-called Axis Sally had gone from teaching English in Germany to talking about how bloody great Adolf Hitler was. When she crossed paths with Monty, it seems she thought there was only enough space on the radio for one American traitor, so she told her boss that man is a spy or a traitor, either he must go or I will. She was wrong, Monty was the real deal, or at least he probably was. We'll explain later why that's questionable. The thing was, Monty was a terrible radio presenter, so the Nazis got him to make propaganda leaflets under the rank of SS Untersturmführer. He was proud as punch. In those leaflets, he tried to persuade Americans that they were living under the out-of-control capitalism or, conversely, they were supporting totalitarianism communism by allying with the Soviets. Monty wrote that they'd live on Easy Street under Adolf Hitler. But as you know, Hitler later had a hard time in a bunker in Berlin just as the Red Army tanks were pounding the streets. The war was lost, so Monty had to make plans. It wasn't as if he could just go back to the US and go, ah, sorry guys, my bad. Monty didn't know the numbers right then, but if he had known, he might have been somewhat nervous. The US convicted about 20,000 soldiers for desertion during the war. 49 were handed a death sentence, but only one was executed, Eddie Slovak. Why only one, you might ask? Well, it seems because Slovak had been a petty criminal in the past, but there were some other political reasons. Just before a firing squad ended his life, he said, They're not shooting me for deserting the United States Army. Thousands of guys have done that. They just need to make an example out of somebody, and I'm it because I'm an ex-con. They're shooting me for the bread and chewing gum I stole when I was 12 years old. Monty didn't know any of this, of course, but no doubt he thought he was going to get shot or hanged if he was caught. Still, you must admit he was brave for what he did next. On May 10, 1945, still dressed in his Nazi uniform, he walked right into an American army base. An Italian-American soldier looked up from the mess tin and said to his buddy, Can you believe the cojones on this guy? It was a risk, but Monty told him he'd used the uniform as part of a daring escape from the clutches of the Nazis. The army didn't know about his radio work in Berlin, so at first, he was just charged with going AWOL and pilfering that P-38 plane. Monty told them he'd used it to fly against the Nazis and that's how he got shot down and taken prisoner. He thought they believed him, so Monty smiled like a Cheshire cat, thinking he got one over on the US military. Things got even better for Monty. He'd been sentenced to 15 years hard labor, but in February 1946, President Harry S. Truman commuted his sentence to time served. He was free. What idiots, he thought. How did these guys win the war? Now he'd fooled the US government. No sooner than he was out, he became a private serving in the Army Air Corps. 
Still, mouths started wagging, and people started looking into who was that American guy who spouted anti-US propaganda on German radio waves. Monty was soon exposed after some crack investigating. Then in 1947, you could read headlines in the Washington Post and the New York Times about an ex-officer being held for treason. The Times wrote what we've told you today, that he had gone on a crazy mission to end up working as a Nazi propagandist. As Monty sat in a jail awaiting his trial, psychologists tried to figure out what made him tick. They said he had superior intelligence according to his IQ score, but they also called him immature and a bit paranoid. People rightly pointed out that he couldn't have been too clever, joining the Nazis when the war was pretty much already lost. We've seen the court transcripts, Monty doesn't say much at all. When he's asked if he stole a plane or if he promoted pro-Nazi stuff on the radio, he just said, that is correct. And when he asked if he was coerced or physically intimidated, he just says no. He admitted to doing everything on his own back, but he was never asked why he did it. On January 18, 1949, Monty was handed a $10,000 fine and sentenced to 25 years in prison, which wasn't bad considering the fate of the chewing gum thief Eddie Slovak. The fine was actually the lowest amount he could be fined for that particular crime. Many people thought he got off very, very lucky. Some people asked if he had any inside help. They said this guy hadn't just gone AWOL. He joined a bunch of guys that had been committed to genocide on a scale that would have shocked Genghis Khan. Monty's light sentence was certainly strange. He didn't seem to care when he was told he'd grow old in prison. He didn't apologize and he didn't complain. He was shipped off to Fort Leavenworth Prison in Kansas, where he spent a bit of time in solitary for going on a hunger strike, and once got in trouble for stealing food from the kitchen. Monty got to taste food as a free man in 1960 after serving way less than 25 years. The tale takes a strange twist here though. In 1963, he tried to get the courts to reverse his traitor conviction. He proclaimed that he wasn't a traitor because he actually went to Germany to help the US. He told the court that he only went to Germany to assassinate Adolf Hitler and to end the war. This didn't work out for him, but it seems he lived a fairly regular life. He moved to Fort Lauderdale in Florida where he kept a low profile until his death in the year 2000. His obituary in the South Florida Sun Sentinel said he popped his clogs, German clogs no doubt, on September 11th that year, exactly one year before the Twin Towers attacks. Monty was buried next to his brothers and parents in Missouri, ending the legacy of the dubious US trader. We think you now need to watch what happens when you go AWOL, or have a look at what happens if you dodge the army draft.